Hello and welcome to today's discussion on the Federalist and Anti-Federalist Papers, sponsored by the Principles of Freedom Foundation. The purpose of this foundation is to provide a platform for discussing the ideas pertaining to freedom, just as was done in the town squares, churches, taverns, and other areas during the founding era of this nation. Ideally, those who listen to or participate in this discussion will have come prepared by having read the materials to be discussed today. Participating in today's discussion are Julie Farnbach, Juliet Bellinger, Leah Hone, David Bishop, Derek Harris, and myself, Brooklyn McClure. We hope you'll continue to participate in the discussion of freedom even beyond this podcast by commenting on our Facebook group, YouTube channel, and most importantly, by conversing with your family and friends on these important topics of freedom. So during this week's reading, not only this week's reading, but as we're now deep into the middle of this study, I felt by studying, you know, six to eight papers a week has lent itself to an immersion in true principles. And so I hope that today we could discuss uh, at least a little bit of what, how you've been taking what you've been learning from these papers or the principles you've been gleaning and applying them in your daily life. Because that's the real point, right? We're not having the exact same arguments as they're having back then, but the principles they used can be assimilated into our lives now and need to be so that we can maintain freedom. So I'll start by sharing a little example. And I, I believe that by small things and simple things, great things happen in your life. So it's a, it's a small example, but uh, so I teach a constitution class to youth right now, and we're planning a trip to the East Coast to see some American history sites. So we're on this executive committee with two other leaders discussing how to fundraise. And we came to this, you know, this back and forth of, well, are the fundraisers going to be for the whole group or are the fundraisers going to be individual? And and as we were having this discussion, I was also reading Federalist Paper um, 54, where, I mean, our the arguments in the Constitution or the Constitutional Convention almost broke apart because they could not decide whether representation should be proportional to population or whether it should be equal. Each state gets the same amount of representatives. And that was the biggest um, stalemate, if you will. They could not decide the big states versus the small states. And finally, gratefully, they came to this um, conclusion that, hey, we'll have one of the houses be equal representation and one is by population. And so, we were coming to that and I, but it was so natural, you know, in this discussion with these other two women, like, oh, wait, I've, I've been reading about this debate before. And the principle is, it doesn't have to be either or. Let's have two prongs to the fundraising. Let's have one way that's a group one and one way that's an individual one. And, and then it worked out. But I don't think that that would have come to me as quickly if I hadn't been immersed in studying true principles. And so I'm grateful for the study that we've been having in these Federalist Papers. Um, but also I think the principle even here is that you should always be immersing yourself in something that has true principles. Um, some people call it a core book, you know, your scriptures or whatever that is, constant immersion in a book that teaches true principles will allow that to naturally flow into all the decisions in your life. So did anybody else have anything else they wanted to share with regard to principles? You know, I think you, know, you talked about their, the founding fathers were not only, so for me, they're not only um, discussing true principles, but they're opening themselves up to receive more true principles. In fact, no decisions would have been made if there were not some opening up and allowing for inspiration for God to teach us. And that's what I'm finding individually as I, I as I've continued to focus on what is my personal um, freedom, where are my barriers of where I need 
more truth. And I'm finding that Christ's injunction to, to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit are actually the leading characteristics to receive truth. Um, we don't create truth, but we can receive it. And I believe you, we receive it from on high. And I find that those who truly love it can receive it. Um, and so I've even, <laughs> I just yesterday, I guess an example was um, I've been frustrated with one of my daughters because I'm trying to, I'm home um, schooling her and she's a bit older and um, often is distracted and not, you know, planning out her time and doing it. And I was then trying to to direct and maybe control her a bit. And so as I set some time down to truly listen and to understand, and, and, and that's something you can feel if someone's just asking the question or if they're really trying to receive and, and really be open. And, I, and um, she was able to identify some things about what's blocking her and what she wants. But I, I felt like just creating that open humility, then I learned more not only about her, but about myself and, and what, I, what I can do. And so I think these are types of things even on a daily basis in a small way where I'm finding that, that kind of a, a broken or an openness to, to truth because we all can shout and say, I have truth. But I think until you say, I need more truth and desire that above all that you can really receive more so. Thank you. That really rings true to me. As you were speaking, I thought about how even looking at myself a year ago or five years ago, I lived by certain truths, but how that's even changed for me, you know, and how I've, but if I weren't open to receiving further, I would still be in that place I was a year ago or five years ago and how it's important to even have forgiveness for yourself. You know, I had someone approach me recently and just beating themselves up for what they've done in the past and really having a hard time forgiving themselves. And, you know, I was open, I forgive you openly, but um, what we need to forgive ourselves and then forgive others. That's one thing I see in our, in our social discourse and in our political discourse very little to no forgiveness. It's like if you've made one mistake and it was 40 years ago and you said one word wrong or it's interpreted wrong, you are crucified and you're, you know, and that's not a true principle that's of, of freedom. True principle of freedom is, you know, this self-forgiveness, but also being, having mercy and grace and forgiveness of others. So thank you for sharing that. Did anyone else have any other thoughts they wanted to share on, on principles. I've got one, but I think it might come naturally later in the conversation. Well, why don't you just go now? Because I know you had a topic that you wanted to bring up to discuss. As right. Well. Um, I don't, I don't remember which letter it was. I think it might have been Melanchthon Smith. Um, but it also could have been Cato. I didn't, I, I, like I said, I've had this whole idea swimming in my head all week. Um, but my, the notes I took as I was reading, um, he talked about certainty versus security. And as I played with those words, I realized that if we're going to have liberty, we have that automatically comes with that is uncertainty. And so that kind of reframed the whole discussion for me because I thought back to Benjamin Franklin or what is attributed to usually Benjamin Franklin's statement that um, he, if we seek security and liberty, we deserve neither and will get neither. So that's a, gr a gross paraphrasing of it, but I know you've all uh, heard that. We, we do have a choice between security and freedom. We cannot have, you know, even a total police state doesn't protect us, our physical safety. And of course it, it completely tramples over our personal liberty. 
So the fact that we, we want security uh, and we sometimes prioritize that is, it seems to me very natural, but something we need to fight against. Um, and, and so it basically came down to, as he's writing this letter, we have to decide how much force and how much choice we're gonna build into this system. That's the bottom line. And he said somewhere in there that the, the general principle is that the people need to be immersed in study in order to understand this constitution. And the thought that came immediately to my mind was, yes, we need to understand the principles and then we need to govern ourselves. And so um, I, a, lot of, a, a lot of the anti-federalist papers sound like whining and a lot of the federalist papers sound like defensiveness. And, and there, when there can't be one right thing or one right person, there has to be compromise, there has to be balance. And I feel like uh, despite all the argumentation on either side, that that's what we ended up with. And that was what was best for us, that we ingrain some principles in the text of the constitution. And at some point we have to say enough, the rest depends on the virtue of the people because we have to learn to govern ourselves. So what I thought a week ago was a intellectual stalemate for me as I go back and forth in this reading. This week I've come to the point where no, we need to outline the basics and then let the rest go and depend on the people to educate themselves and to be virtuous. And that that is a fair ask. Very fair ask right there. And okay, so the Benjamin Franklin quote is, uh, he who would trade liberty for some temporary security deserves neither liberty nor security. And like you said, you end up sacri eventually sacrificing both. I, and I can't help but think, I don't know, I wanna get your guys' opinion on this because as I've been just reading these Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers, it seems like they both want the same thing. Like Juliet's mentioned in the past, they, they both want liberty and they both want security, it's just, the degree to which you have force and coercion and to which you give up some of your liberty for security, which we do, and that's what the constitution is, but it's supposed to be very minimal. Um, but do you think the argument is the same today? Do, do you think it is? I, I don't know, I wanna put it out there because I keep getting actually thoughts of Samuel in the Old Testament where the people want a king. This is Samuel, right? And he keeps going to the Lord and being like, mm, you know, this isn't the best path. And finally he's like, we'll give him the, you have to give him the king because that's what they want. And, and it's happened a few times in history, right? Where people desire a king. It even happened after the revolutionary war, they were going to make Washington a king again. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, are we in the same situation? Is it the argument right now in general among society between, no, we both want, you know, limited government and freedom and liberty, but it just, you know, should we do this constitution thing? Is that too much, giving too much power to federal government? Or is it more of a, no, a lot of people want a king or even communism or socialism versus, something totally different and, and does it matter? Does the argument matter? What, what are your thoughts on that? I've had some thoughts on that, Brooke, um, especially as we've been, dis I mean, as we've been discussing this, one thing that keeps on coming to my mind is consequences. And as we've seen things, um, I don't know, evolve or devolve, I don't know how you wanna look at it, um, in our society and in our politics, um, what keeps on coming to my mind is consequences that because it's like what, what, what Julie was saying, it's based on, and, and what the founders expected of us was an educated people, right? Educated and virtuous people, people that would seek out that education, that would be virtuous, that would make 
choose moral leaders. And we're not doing any of those things now, right? As a society, as a people. And, but the true principles are true principles and they're going to reveal themselves in, in one way or another. But I feel like we're at a point now and, I, and as I see things happen um, where I used to get more discouraged, now I'm just like, you know what? We're past the tipping point and maybe we, we need to, um, not that we need to, but we have no choice but to allow people to um, l- like see the consequences before they can realize the mistake. You know what I mean? So like, like we are, people are thinking like socialism more socialist ideals are, are good. Well, we know based on history, right? And again, true principles of freedom that they are not good. They are not going to work. But I kind of feel like we're at a point where it's like, maybe we have to um, go further into the darkness before people are going to realize like, whoa, 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 you know, but I feel like that when you talk about um, I think about it with my kids all the time when we talk about coercion and um, versus, you know, freedom and all these different things. Well, for my kids, especially um, in the last several years, I've just kind of like my parenting style has been more of you to a certain extent. It's like, I will let you make these choices, but you have to realize that there's, there's consequences. And we've, you know, talked a lot about, you know, your choices are your choices. Those are not my choices. Like you answer for those choices. Um, for me, as a, your parent, I answer for, for, for what I have to answer for. But as you become an adult, like that's your choices you have to answer for and the consequences that come with it, right? So we try to guide them instead of trying to push them or coerce them. It's their coercion is like warning them of the consequences. So I kind of feel like that's where we are now is just because we are not a virtuous people anymore and because we are not a well-educated people, we are not a people who are, um, I mean, there are individuals and, um, and pockets, but as like a society, as a country, um, we have been just led down this path where people don't educate themselves um, and they're not making, you know, virtuous choices. So what, everything that we're talking about is based on that, right? That's what the founders had establish this country on so where do we go from here but to learn from those mistakes before people can make that turn to like oh we had to turn back to the principles that they will realize are true principles that they can't see right now because they're in a, a darkness I guess I'll stop rambling no I thought those were good thoughts Leah thank you um one of the things I I was struck with this week in Madison's writings were he just seemed so optimistic and he had and to me in he, he in that he had so much faith it seemed in how the people would act and how they would vote you know and and it's what you're talking about Leah that it was based on this belief that people you know generally were w- would seek after um a deeper education that they would you know try to be virtuous and try to elect educated and virtuous people. And, you know, I kept, I kept looking, reading him and going, gosh, he really, he really didn't foresee what was going to happen. He really, you know, where he was so, you know, um, had such good foresight in so many ways, this was an area where he really didn't see it. And then I was like, oh, but maybe I'm just being too pessimistic and, and not giving, extending enough grace to people. And then it struck me um, that I think one of the big issues is the definition we have today of educated and the definition that we have today as a society, and I'm saying as a society, not necessarily in this group, um, of virtuous has fundamentally shifted. It no longer is, they're not in, they're not in the same ballpark. In them anymore. And it's funny because I've been listening to that um, America's Founding Fathers series from the great courses. And it's interesting to listen to the, the little, but not little, some, some are little and some are not so little vices of, of these founding, you know, gentlemen and, and, um, you know, there, it, it's nothing new. It's the same kind of things we experience today in politics. Um, but again, going back to what you said, Brooke, you know, there's, there's still, there's still, um, we don't need to crucify people for their mistakes, you know, 
little, especially these smaller ones or personal ones. Um, but there's such a fundamental shift between what we define as educated and, and virtuous today. And I think until, I think it's difficult now to even say those words and, and get people to have a, a common definition, if that makes sense. So when you say educated, you know, I was just speaking with a friend today and we were talking about how so frequently it, it's a reliance on experts whatever that means, you know, to somebody. And it often um, has to do with some sort of, you know, ed, you know, schooling, schooling or certification or whatever, um, but, not, but not necessarily always, you know, a deep education on a topic. And then with the virtue, there's just such a, a broad, a broad definition out there of what, what virtuous is. And I think also a almost a demonization of certain, um, you know, certain people or groups that put value on certain virtues. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Oh, Leah, did you have a response to that? Yeah, I, well, I was just thinking, you know, um, um, kind of to add to like what, what Juliet was saying, it just made me think, you know, despite what I was like saying about like, you know, people, um, like how we're not as a society, you know, virtuous or seeking that education. I, I think about like coming back to true principles, right. That, um, and we, we were discussing, you know, today in our, in our, um, constitution class with the kids about, um, our guest speaker was talking about, you know, um, what is true law, you know, and God's law and how it's important because that is unchanging. Right. So these true principles, um, it, what I, and Brooke, we were just talking about this earlier, and what I keep on seeing is that they are coming to light. So even though it seems discouraging because we are not this as a people, you see as things get so bad that people are starting to see like the consequences and that people are starting to have this desire. I've seen the desire in people to seek out that education. They're starting to realize, wait a second, I don't know. I don't know these true principles of freedom. I don't, like they, they kind of know that there's, they have a sense of it and they know that that's generally what we were supposed to, you know, what America is supposed to be about. And, but they, they aren't familiar with the constitution. They're not familiar with the principles of freedom. They just maybe intuitively know that they're there and they know that something's wrong. And now they have that desire is coming around. So again, that, that true principle that like, no matter how bad things get, I feel like because it is God's law, like you can't escape it. So people, you know, as God's children, I feel like are, um, having that that um, desire in their hearts and um, that realization of their lack of a no personal knowledge however you want to describe education you're right Juliet like people have all kinds of different you know um, views of education obviously like in um, our homeschooling um, philosophies that that most of us follow we believe you know in self-education you know education doesn't come from from the outside but from from our own studies and um, from within so our own efforts. So um, I see, I see that change in people. So it gives me so much hope that sometimes when we think that like, like how could, you know, I wonder about like James Madison, like how, and so many of the founders, like that their expectations, like how could they not see, you know, where people were going to go to, but maybe they did see further than we do because we're in a, in a darker place right now, but I see this light coming out, you know, where people are themselves starting to see that they need to find those, that truth that's missing in, 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 not in their lives, like religiously, but um, those true principles of freedom. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And to, in a little bit of Madison's defense, so in paper 55, I think he did, he did see that this was a possibility, but we have to understand he's like, he's a lawyer. These Federalist papers and these newspapers are like his courtroom floor where he has to prove the point to get this passed. So of course, he's not going to bring up too much of the possibility of what's happening right now. But I think he knows it um, when he says, I am unable to conceive that the people of America in their present temper or under any circumstance which can speedily happen will choose and every second year repeat the choice of 65 or 100 men who would be disposed to form and pursue a scheme of tyranny or treachery. 
you know, and speaking of the the House of Representatives, he's like, Americans right now in their current temper and and it couldn't happen very quickly, like in the next few years, that they wouldn't just flush out any representatives who had tyranny or treachery or, you know, in them. Now we see that that has slid <laughs> and we are into a place now where people are senators or, or representatives for most of their lives. And that's not what was intended. But I, I do think that he knew that was possible. Um, but yeah, I do. It's kind of like Shakespeare, how some people are like, it's, it's so crazy. You know, they all end up dying. And it is like Shakespeare did that, though, to prove a point of this is the extreme example of, you know, jealousy or rage or anger. And I feel like Madison and some of these founding fathers have done that in these the Federalist Papers mostly. The Anti-Federalist Papers, I found them to be a little more, are they they easier to read? They're easier for me to read. They, they seem to be um, a little more fear-based, but, and that's another thing I found it, I don't know, what, what is your opinion on this, guys? But I found that a lot of their fears that they had haven't come to pass, but there were ones that they didn't even anticipate that have. I don't know if you noticed that. But some of them have, absolutely. Some of them, they, they called it <laughs> right on. Um, Derek, did you have something? Yeah, so what I've discovered is it, the Anti-Federalists is a name that came later. That's not what they identified as. They, they thought that they were the true Federalists. And so they viewed themselves as the ones that were... Um, that were more thoughtful and they put a lot of thought into their papers and they were well read and they all of these men from both sides were referring to experiences from the past whether it was rome greece or um in biblical times and um i i have grown to uh love both sides um because i don't see the vitriol that exists in today's arena where you know, if you don't agree with me, then you're the devil and you want the world to blow up because my bill that says uh, we love the planet bill, I'm just making that up, but they try to paint these bills with these beautiful sounding names and they load them up with all this other, um, <laughs> uh, you know, first of all, they make it unreadable because they make them thousands of pages and then they, you know, pass them without reading them. I mean, it's totally the antithesis of the government that was set up by these founding fathers. And so I've really grown to love them and whether it's the anti-federalist or the federalist as we call them, um, because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, Sam Adams and Patrick Henry, true patriots, they were on the anti-federalist uh, side of the aisle and they loved our country. They didn't hate our country. And it seems like nowadays you see two sides where one seems to be pushing for, pulling for the country to win and the other one seems to be pulling down the country and all of its symbols and it's just it's bizarre to me i don't understand it um I, I love how brooke brought up um the great compromise that's what it's called when they couldn't figure out how to come together with the big states and the small states and again my rock star hero richard sherman glad to give him another plug because it was his brain trust that and i think he was inspired because he read his he read his bible every day before before session and I think he was inspired. And uh, when people like Thomas Jefferson say, I've never heard him say a foolish thing, I, that tells me he's very thoughtful and highly respected by all those men. And so when he finally arrived to a conclusion, I think that he, because he was one of the more outspoken in the, in the convention, um, uh, had a lot of ears on his, you know, people would listen to him rather than, oh, let's wait until he's done with his filibuster and then I can re-engage my mind in what's going on. And I think everybody was well engaged in, in what Richard Sherman had to say um, with, the, with the great compromise as his legacy is great. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, if that's okay, the, the constraints that the anti-federalist papers talk about, they think it was too um, it was too blurry. It was too, it wasn't well-defined. And um, the example that I think of with the executive is um, there was no term limits. And so as the constitution was written, and then as George Washington uh, saw to 
saw to it that the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments were added to the constitution, there was still nothing um, enumerated in um, the limit of the president of the United States. But George Washington, after running for two terms, said, I'm going back to my farm and that's that. And Thomas Jefferson himself uh, encouraged him to run for a third term. But as you notice, after Thomas Jefferson served two terms, he followed that example. And that was followed by, by many. And then of course, we know the, Rose, the Roosevelt boys, we got Teddy and we got FDR. Teddy ran for a third term under the Blue Bull Moose party. And uh, FDR, of course, died in office on his fourth term, where um, even a majority of his own party saw the danger of uh, of an endless reelection of president. And so the uh, the amendment to uh, limit the term of office of the executive is now in place. Okay, there's one amendment that's good. Now we need to, uh, don't don't you think we need to implement that with Congress, with with the legislature, with the legislative branch, with the Senate, and with the le uh, I just think that there's so much more we can do. And, and, and I know, I think Julie is a proponent of you know, getting rid of the 17th Amendment. I am, I am too, I'm on board with that um, because we need to get closer to the voice of the people. If one person could run for office and represent one person, we would have freedom because that one person that voted for that one person that's represented them would say, I like your ideas, I'm gonna reelect you. If I don't like, like your ideas, I'm the one person that could kick you out of office. So you better be listening to me. That's how important it is to be as close to the people when you're an elected um, uh, administrator. And um, when you get to these big, huge, vast numbers of people that, that elect um, a representative for them, they're not as accountable to the people. That's why the lowest form of government that can solve a problem should. And that needs to, needs to be, the, be the focus. I know I've said a lot. What do you guys think? <laughs> I just want to add really quick because I w recently was rereading 55 Fathers for, for our class. And, um, you know, Roger Sherman, he it's interesting because he actually did not trust the people. He didn't trust the people to make the important decisions of, um, of, of like, you know, voting in, um, um, voting in our legislature and all that kind of stuff. Like he, he had a lot of issues with, 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 putting trust in the people. And I, in reading about it, I'm like, why, like, it seemed wrong. And now in our situation now, I think he was right. But anyways, I just thought that was like interesting. So I was reading about that, about him recently. I, I'm kind of curious what you think about that since I know you're a, a big fan of his. Well, I was going to say, yeah, talking about, I mean, putting, it's okay to be close to the people, but there's a reason we have a Republic and that it's not a democracy because that's actually really dangerous to have this mob rule mentality where you could have 51% of the people overthrowing you know, the other 49%. Um, but what I also thought about with regard to the amendments, as Madison stated earlier that, that we just quoted, there was this expectation that people are moral, virtuous, and will govern themselves. And if they will do that, then there is no need for additional laws and constraints. And it actually worked pretty well for, you know, 100 years or so, um, even amidst the normal human nature um, frailties. But yeah, you saw that society, once it starts slipping more into selfishness, self-aggrandizement, you know, then it, it's true, government does need to come in or the people need to put more constraints and more laws, but then it starts ballooning out of control almost. So do we need to put term limits on our representatives? I mean, yes and no. I mean, if the people are not going to virtuously pay attention and vote according to, um, Standards. I mean, one of the problems is we only usually have 15 to 30 percent voter turnout, right? So you don't even have most people. I think the breakdown really comes down to individuals. Individuals are not uh, living their lives responsibly, and so it just goes, you know, up the chain. That that's just my opinion. Should we implement more amendments to the Constitution to take care of that? Maybe, but I think the biggest problem is you have to take care of individuals and families. I have lots to say about a lot of what you said. Um, one thing I'll just 
dispense with quickly. Um, I've always been against term limits on principle because I think it takes the responsibility away from the voters to pay attention and to suffer the consequences of their votes. Um, I do think, however, that we're past a tipping point where I would absolutely support term limits because the people have demonstrated for so long now that they are not paying attention and that the representatives are blatantly taking advantage of that. So yeah, I would agree with, uh, with Derek at this point, but in principle, we shouldn't have had to. If we were properly educated and being virtuous and paying attention and living with the consequences. And I think, Brooke, the, um, we kind of skipped over your very first question at the beginning uh, about whether we disagree, uh, where the disagreement is in America. And I think the divide isn't between what we want and what they want. It's between how we get, it's between two different options for how we get there. And one, one side is willing to have government uh, provide the services. And of course, I feel like that that's not government's place because government represents force and government can use force. And I refuse to vote to coerce my neighbor to pay me taxes through into a, a program I benefit from and, and so on and so on. So um, I, I do think mostly we want the same things. We just have a fundamental disagreement about the best way to do that. And I believe that we are coming to a day of reckoning because people think that government can do it better for us than we can do it for ourselves. And um, I have lots of family members and a, a significant number of friends who, who believe government can do it better. Um, having sat on government boards and sat in committees, um, I can promise you that a group of people uh, of diverse backgrounds will experience synergy and do well for some things, but no committee is going to live my life better than I can live my own life. And no committee can I appropriately delegate my natural rights to to impose their will on anybody else. Government is force, taxation is theft. Those libertarian ideals seem really off-putting uh, just on the face of it. But when you look deeply at the methods by which we pretend to have a right to control each other, um, it all falls apart because my rights end where your rights begin. And I have no right to determine how you live your life, no right to absolve you of the consequences of your choices or to pass on the consequences of my choices to you. And that requires some deep analysis and some personal humility and a good education to understand all of that is fundamental to the division we see in my opinion. I agree, Julia. I think apathy has taken over. Um, we've all talked about education, but how many people are having this kind of type of conversation? How many people are are um, are are heading a, a, a book club like Juliet's doing? And um, how many people are, you know, going over vocabulary and and oh, here's a here's you know here's a new word and and trying to elevate their discussion instead. You know, the four letter words that we hear all over the place are used as substitutes for thousands of words that could be used in their place. Um, it, it, it's kind of a sad state, state, of, state of affairs that we're in right now. Um, and it seems like as I work through what's going on politically, I try to break it down to, is this policy, this law, this rule, um, whatever you want to call it, that's, that's moving forward um, to be legislated, is it going to force me to do something against my will? Or is it going to encourage me to exercise my, my free conscience? And um, that, that, that's, my, that's my breakdown. What about you? Yeah, thank you for that thought. Um, 
we have to wrap it up here, but I I like that uh, litmus test that you have for voting there. You know, how much does it coerce or how much does it give you freedom to choose? And I, I wanted to end on this note. Um, Douglas Gibbs came and spoke to our, our government class today. And he had shared this, something about the Pledge of Allegiance that I'd never known. So the Pledge of Allegiance originally was written by a socialist in our, in our country to try to encourage more socialism. And specifically, socialism wants you to pledge allegiance to the government rather than to God. Because if you're pledging allegiance to God, then that means they're above the government and, and that's threatening to the government. And so he, but he said how the American people took that and added um, one nation under God. And so it's the potential of the American people to take something that is instituted, that is not best for our constitution, constitutional republic, and to change it into something that is. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that that's something that we'll be able to do as a nation, as a people, and we're doing it here by, by discussing these principles of freedom. So thank you everyone for coming to this discussion and we'll see you next time.